cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Brandy, Ari, thank you so much for taking the time today to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no, th- this should be fun. And, you know, we're at, what, about two and a half weeks for IPNC? Yeah. And, uh, oh, are, are, are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was such a surprise. Uh, you know, I mean, you aren't, uh, you can't submit, you're nominated. And uh, you, your wine goes through a double blind sommelier panel. And I didn't know any of this was happening. I just got a DM in my inbox one day from somebody on the board that was like, yeah, we hope we see you and Ari at IPNC this year. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool. I haven't been in a few years and it would be awesome to go. And they're like, no, sweetie, <laughs> we want you to be a featured winery this year. And I was like, what? what's happening and how did i had no idea it was completely out of the blue yeah wow, really that, that is that is quite nice i was i was going to ask what the process was but you kind of already like like did it and that's that's amazing <laughs> that so it, it, it sounds like the board you know comes up with you know some wineries that they want to to have and people kind of you know internally vote and then out of the blue you just get notified yeah yeah, Brandy had met John Hernandez on the board at Assemblage last year, which is a, a, a diversity, uh, diversity inclusion, and, yeah. equity and inclusion. And he asked for some of the wine and told me he right. was going to share it with the board, which I just figured, oh, they're just having dinner or barbecue or whatever. And he's taking some bottles. Never would have thought that it was for no idea. to be included <laughs> in the process. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's great. Well, con- congratulations. I'm very much... Looking forward to, to seeing your wines out there and, you know, seeing the both of you in, in, in person in a couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to be speaking oh. on one of the panels for University of Pino, too, which is quite an honor um, and a little scary because, of course, the theme is all about sustainability. And when you're a label as small as we are, you know, in order to speak to that in a big way, you kind of, I think, have to dig really deep to uh, bring something significant to the table. Well, I mean, you have quite the story, quite the background. I mean, I have no doubt you'll you'll just knock it out of the ballpark. <laughs> Thank you so much. She's very well prepared. <laughs> She's very much a study of the prepared, so I'm sure she'll be more prepared than a lot of the time. I've been to plenty of seminars where people weren't very prepared, so I know she'll be ready to rock and roll. Yes, yes. No, I'm, I'm sure that she will be. Uh, and talk about being prepared. I mean, so Brandy, you have a background in journalism and you've enjoyed telling, you know, telling stories, you know, in smaller towns and everything. What was it about the the smaller towns that you just really enjoyed so much? I think a lot of that was growing up. I mean, my grandparents lived, were in a small town out in uh, rural Oklahoma and my grandfather used to take me in his big red pickup truck at the end of the day and drive around and tell me stories about everyone. And you could see how the community was connected with each other. And I fell in love with that, I think, as a really young girl. And that, you know, was something that I was looking for throughout my life. I remember when I was a reporter in a rural area in New Mexico, driving around being like, oh, yeah, I know these people on this road and I know how they're connected. And, oh, those people knows that people. I'm like, I am my grandfather now. And it was such a a beautiful feeling. Um, I mean, so much of it is the storytelling and it's about what connects us and uh, there's nothing more powerful than that for me. So it's definitely a big passion in my life. I I can imagine. I mean, I love, I mean, I, I love all the storytelling that there is in wine. And so yes. I can only imagine on, on your end, you know, all the, all the storytelling. Oh, but I, I have to ask like how many, cat shows have you done cat fashion shows have you done and wow. uh, I, I mean i i just i, I just got to know about this so okay there was definitely two okay maybe three 
cat fashion shows <laughs> had to come. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, they're all beautiful though. At the same time, it's like, yeah, you're not going out and doing the most glamorous stories all the time necessarily. I mean, you certainly get your share, but you get really involved in a community. And when you're writing about things like this, is it glamorous? No. Hilarious? Yes. Glamorous? No. But the stories that you write, like these are the families, they're going to clip this out and they're going to put it in, you know, a little memory book and they read this and they're going to cherish it forever. And there's, there's something to be said about that as well. <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, no, that that is great. And then, you know, you drove up to Portland, sight unseen, and just, just yes. fell in love with it. Absolutely. But yes. what what got you sucked into the world of wine? Were you in wine before you drove to Portland? I mean, what, what was it? So my, uh, my family, it's very interesting. You know, most people move out of their house when they go to college. My parents moved out of the house when I went to college and started working all over the country. And I stayed home and took care of the house, which was weird, but awesome. And they ended up in Sonoma and I would fly out and see them. I was just 21 years old. Wine hadn't been a part of my life growing up. Uh, and then I went out to see them and they're like, hey, so we've discovered this thing called wine tasting. <laughs> And we'd like to, you know, <laughs> share that with you. And I'm like, 21. Okay, cool. Let's let's figure this out. And so we're going to these beautiful right. wineries in Sonoma. And uh, you know, I think it's rare if you don't grow up in this industry, if you live outside of it, you know, you don't really know how to start appreciating wine until, you know, after you get through your Boone's Farm phase that everyone goes through as a rite of passage. And here I was getting introduced to these beautiful things. For the first time in my life so i knew i loved that and i knew i loved the west coast lifestyle like i tried out new york was not for me winters 103 inches of snow not for me um and so i was just looking to go somewhere new and came to portland and journalism it turns out is not a growth industry uh, especially print journalism and i kind of saw the writing yeah. on the wall there and my my parents ended up retiring out here. My dad wanted to buy some property and I thought, okay, so if he wants to plant vines and we're going to do this and we're going to do this as a family. One of us needs to actually know what we're doing versus reading some books. Uh, so I thought it was a good time to re-career and uh, enrolled in the Chemeketa program. I was living in Portland at the time and working in a newspaper in Battleground, Washington. So in order for me to take classes, I had like a 200 mile commute. <laughs> uh, and I did that Oof. for a few years, just kind of pecked away at it because, you know, if you find something you love, it's worth pursuing that way. And I just, I, I made it happen right. over time, very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. That That is quite the, quite the journey. And, you know, it's, you just, we just never know how we're going to get into the into the actual world of wine. Yeah, and I love that everybody comes from such different places. I think that's what makes this industry so dynamic is so many people bring such a varied uh, skill set to the table. It's it's incredibly inspiring. Yeah, it, it is. And, and Ari, you came from Arizona. You had your yeah. own handyman business before you know, before you came to Portland, but you yeah. also came to Portland sight unseen <laughs> and you're yeah. going through the Twilliger curves and you're like, wow, there's Portland. What, amazing. what was your thought when you first saw Portland coming? I was blown Just away. Amazing. I've seen, I mean, I've seen Portland in a movie after I decided to move here, uh, but it was more like out towards the coast area and, or I guess Oregon rather. And right. I just like really didn't know what to expect and came around those curves and saw I mean, this was Portland. It was really, it's kind of odd now because this was Portland but like 17, 18 years ago, something like that, which at the time people were saying, right. oh my God, you should have been here 10 years ago. It's a completely different city. And now, you know, we go back to Portland and it's a completely different place when we move there. So it was just really at this exciting time yeah. in Portland where you could still be an artist and have a part-time job at a coffee shop and go to the shows and go and do all the things. Uh, and I had always lived way out in the sticks. So it was just, uh, it was a bit of a culture shock, but it was exactly what I needed at the same time. 
Wow, and that, that is celebrate. awesome. And oh, and, and this, you know, so I, I came, I, I moved up from Portland or moved to Portland from Tennessee in 2001. And I, the, the summers, I just fell in love with the summers here. They're, they're just gorgeous. Here in like June 1st, yeah. I had to wear a hoodie the first month I was here. It was a really cold summer. It was, I couldn't <laughs> believe it back home. It was 110 degrees. <laughs> so I thought I'd drove through a season. It, yeah, no, it's, yeah. <laughs> It it is crazy. I uh, you know I'm, I'm a bicyclist, and I would you know I liked riding my bike in the mornings, and getting on the bike in the mornings. You know when I first moved here, I'm like, this is cold. This isn't fun. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Yes, exactly. So you don't need a cold bath. You know, you just ride through it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, so Ari, do you think that you would have ever gotten into wine if you hadn't? you know, met Brandy in, in the Laurelhurst Park and I don't think so. I you mean, know, you know, I mean, you, you brought your sour. That was really, I wouldn't have been as receptive to it. That's for sure. You know, people would have said, oh, let's go wine tasting. I'm like, oh, right. sure. I just didn't like wine. I, growing up, <laughs> my parents never drank wine, had it once, way right. too much of it that one time and was pretty turned off <laughs> by it. And uh, so, yeah, well, you know, was, Sometimes, yeah, well, I was just going to say, wine. sometimes, you know, people have too much tequila. In your case, it was just too much red wine or too much exactly. wine. Exactly. Precisely. Well, tequila talking that because I did have it too much tequila time, but I still do enjoy it. But uh, yeah, it was kind of funny. Uh, your brain talked about wine in the beginning, and I was like, oh, I really like wine. And, you know, it's almost, uh, it almost killed my chance of that first day. But <laughs> had a very, a moment that really, I think, sort of typifies our relationship at that during that uh, meeting. So I drank this beer, which now I think is horrible. It's a Dutch sour beer. I tried it again recently out of nostalgia and threw away the $11 bottle of beer. <laughs> I'm really red and heady and thick and all of this. And we were at that, uh, we were in Laurel Horse Park and I think you were drinking Raymond's Wood Oh yeah, early yeah, days. Which, whatever. Yeah, hey, yeah, whatever. No shame on anything. <laughs> and we switched and uh, Brady just, tasted that beer and she goes which turned out to be very on brand so you don't like you're telling me you don't like wine but this is your favorite beer and i'm drinking this red wine thinking yeah these are not really all that far apart and then went out to wine country and i was i mean if it was love at first sight with brandy it was equal with the wine and so the two things just ended up coming together it just it ended up being this like amalgamation of everything I've loved the most in my life, which is outdoors and my virgin love of gardening, living with the seasons. You know, you have, you know, I, I love that. I talk about it a lot in tasting rooms. It's like you have science on one end of winemaking and the art on the other. And I think in the vineyard too, you can say that that same scale applies and where you want to land. And I went to art school. I love science. So, it just became this amazing thing. And then obviously I love to talk and gregarious. And then I get into the tasting room, realize there's this whole social <laughs> aspect of it. And then you get into, you know, if you want to get deep into it, yeah. the way wine is, we share wine. That's what it's there for. Wine and food. It's about being shared and becoming a part of someone's life in that story. And so it just became that whole thing altogether. And here we are living outside of premier wine region of the world, which is, I mean, it's yeah, amazing. We're so incredibly, you know, fortunate to to live where we are, and it's yes. oh, it's wonderful. But uh, you know, obviously, and I may have the time frame uh, confused in my head, so my apologies. But obviously, you know, the the sour beer wasn't a turnoff because weren't you all engaged like two and a half weeks later or something like that? Pretty much, we didn't tell anybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we pretty much got engaged <laughs> after about two weeks. Somewhere there, yeah. About, yeah. And we're like, um, let's just keep yeah. this to ourselves because <laughs> everyone's going to think we're crazy and maybe rightfully so. So we just kind of waited for the rest of the world to catch up to us. Uh, and that was six months, I think, after. 15 years ago? <laughs> It's so many years ago now that I don't even know. 15. Yeah, 2007. So. It, it's okay. a big blur. Yeah. It is, yeah. <laughs> you've, yeah you, you've had way too much fun. Yes, it's 
probably yes, true. Yes, way, way too much fun. <laughs> Wine making and grape growing is nothing but fun. You know, so. <laughs> and, that, and that's what you need. You, life just needs to be full of fun and happiness and enjoying those that are, that are around you. Yes. So Brandy, uh, you mentioned, you know, that your, your parents moved out of the house, uh, but eventually they, you know, um, landed, uh, you know, in, I think in Newburgh and yeah. bought two and a half acres. Mm -hmm. Was it all the, um, like the wine tastings and stuff in Sonoma that your dad was like, yeah, I want to plant vines. hundred percent. I mean, he's such a project guy. Um, he's always up to something. So you know, this was going to be his uh, retirement project versus what I call other people retiring into this in a professional scale as their encore career, because that is nobody retires into wine that doesn't exist. Um, but for him, it, it was very much a, a hobby vineyard, uh, I would say. And uh, he just throws himself at it and is so dedicated and um it's 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 very sweet to see and it's been a wonderful way to have a, a more significant connection with my father in this phase of his life yeah it's one of right. the most no, that, that is <laughs> yeah. yeah helps in your back door is only feet from the vines and you have a job <laughs> and he's always trying to think of something crazy like um uh their property is right next to Natalie's estate and uh, Boyd is just a wonderful neighbor. We love Boyd and Cassandra and Boyd will be driving by and see my dad out there and he'll have attached like a, a leaf blower to um, the spray nozzle for sulfur so that he can really like get up underneath <laughs> those vines without having to like spend all the money on a commercial uh, you know, piece of equipment and boy, I'll run into him. He's like, your dad's crazy. And he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I want the ability to, to retire a little bit and just, uh, you know, have all day to figure out how to do awesome stuff like that. That would be amazing. Right? What a gift. Yeah. 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 It is such a gift. Um, and you talked about, you know, the, the two of you exploring wine company and, or wine country and falling in love with it. Uh, <clears throat> and over the last 15 years, you know, so much has changed. But like those early days when the two of you were out just exploring, you know, were there one, two, three, ten wineries that you were just like, yes, these are our favorites. And this is what, you know, th these are like our go to's. The one that really stands out to me the most is 2012, maybe the beginning of 2013. And so it's very early on and going to Badon, which is no longer Don and Vicky are gone from there. But Ugh. just it was, I mean, everybody, yeah. Don was that crazy cowboy, exciting guy, but he had the three, he had the 777, the 667, and the 115 that he made individually and then a blend of them. So it was also. It is so hard to get really into the clones unless you're in a cellar on a regular basis because there are very few single clone bottles. And it was just the place and that little intimacy. And so it was like still on that, it was still on that part of kind of in the barn. The big houses hadn't really, I mean, Panerash was open at the time. There was a few, but it was still kind of on that edge of feeling of that beginning stage of the valley. I mean, that was when we were still going to Thanksgiving and Memorial Day when we could because we weren't working in the business and it was still the beginning of those right. weekends exciting chaos that they were i just felt like you know, we were right in the beginning of that almost like when we got to portland and we were right at the beginning of kind of all the birth of all the subcultures and everything that was exciting happening there just roll the dice on the uh tithing flies and scored well and another interesting <laughs> thing is my folks when they when they moved out here initially and they were looking for land to purchase they uh they called me like oh we found a house to rent and it's on calkins lane and um it's on this i think it's called the burstrom property and i'm like wait what <laughs> you just landed living on the burstrom property and you're brand new to the wine country okay cool um and so we would go out congratulations and out. yeah i know right uh, we would get to uh, hang out in our evenings right up there on that top of the hill in Calkins Lane and look down. And that was back when uh, Delancelotti was right behind as well. And actually, the cuttings 
for our vines came from their property. They let my dad go out there and, oh. and do cuttings, which he kept in little red, you know, party solo cups um, <laughs> around the bathtub for what a year, at yeah. least a year before they bought their property and we uh, planted them there. So just kind of a fun, fun story of how we got our vines. <laughs> Wow. Wow. You know, um, you know, Vidan also holds just a very special place in my heart and not very recently I, uh, interviewed Drew Allen, the, um, the, you know, uh, who bought Vidan. Oh. And, uh, one of the stories that he told me was he was trying to make an, um, he was trying to understand what he was getting himself into when he was going to buy Vidan. And so he asked Don, he's like, so what does a typical day look like for you? And Don says, well, you know, I, I'm an early riser. So, I, you know, I get up, you know, I might go mess with the, uh, with the sprinkler system a, a little bit and, you know, might get on the tractor and, you know, and yeah, then, then I'll get on the computer for a little bit. Then I'll, 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 I'll take a nap. And, you know, Drew was like, oh, well, that, that doesn't sound too hard. <laughs> and so Drew uh, and his wife, they uh, Drew and his wife, they, they still keep in contact with Don and Vicky. And uh, Drew is, you know, on multiple occasions has told Don, it's like, you know, you really had me going with with that story of, you know, your, your typical day, because that is the exact opposite of how it goes. <laughs> That's so, real. Yeah. Anyway, I just I. I I love all all the stories and you know, like I said, Vidan just holds a special place in my heart. Um so Ari, you you decided to submit um gray ring gray wing wines to James Suckling without Brandy yeah. knowing. And and you got some good scores out of it, but how did you even approach Brandy and tell her like, Hey, so I did oh, this thing awesome. and well, it turned so out funny. really well. Yeah. It was, a, it was kind of a funny story because I saw that, Oh, James Suckling, only two bottles. I can hand deliver them. No entry fee. This is easy. You know, let me just do this. Cause who knows? Whatever. Didn't really expect again with our size. It's like IPNC with our size. I didn't, I didn't even expect to get anything on that. And, uh, and I think I even told her at one point, but you know, with the busy kind of chaotic lives, I think it was just kind of like, oh yeah, that's fine, whatever. And, but they don't tell you, you can only find out the scores by logging in. So I just kept waiting and finally got to a point and actually Anna Metziger was, uh, I can't remember what she was, uh, helping monitor with the red one. So I saw her on basis and she had submitted scores. And so we'd see each other every few weeks and be like, share anything? No. I think it to a point where I just figure they probably just didn't score them and whatever. That's fine. It's not two bottles. I'll never forget because I'm out at the table on the patio Montanor telling them how scores don't matter. Don't worry about it. Just drink what you like. Love what you like. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I walk inside and I get a text message. It's a screenshot from Brandy. It's had taken a photo of a computer screen because the marketing manager, Fairsing, had been looking at Fairstein scores, and because our wine is the Pinot is made from oh. Fairstein, she found that and she sent Brandy the link. And I'm looking at this shot, and of course, it's a screen, it's a photo of a screen, so I'm just trying to figure out what I'm even looking at. And all of a sudden, I realized, well, God, this is 93, 92 points from James Suckling. So I immediately ran out to the table and told them, I just <laughs> forgot what I just said. Get it. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a pretty fun way to well, that, find out. That's awesome. In the middle of the day from Brandy, who didn't know that it was even happening. So, <laughs> yeah. sometimes being good. It's, it's nice to have those sorts of surprises. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. <laughs> it's a lot of surprises yeah. between, again, between that and IP and C. It's been uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you talk about your size being, you know, small. And I got the, the 92. So that's always been a funny thing in the family. But. 
So the the nineteen got a ninety two, and what was the other one that was submitted? Ninety three for the eighteen, yeah. Okay, okay, nice. Oh, uh, you know, you you talk about being small, and you know the the sparkling bubble is just exploding all over the place. Um, why did you decide to get into into sparkling? Any, any day that has bubbles in it is probably pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I, I love bubbles yes. right away. It was kind of what I wanted to do when I went to school, you know, back to school. I knew that sparkling was something I wanted to make. It wasn't really big in the Valley at that point. Of course, you had Argyle and Rocco and, you know, a few things here and there, but not, you didn't really see it very much. And that surprised me because I'm like, well, wait, we're a cool climate. Wait, we grow Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Why don't we just grow some Pinot Meunier here? Like what? I mean, the, the elements all seemed right to me at the time. And I thought, well, you know, hey, Portland, Portland is such a brunch crowd, uh, bubbles and brunch. I mean, there's a market here. This should be what I do. And then, of course, I got involved in it and realized in order to make a bottle of bubbles that the Portland brunch crowd could afford would probably not be possible on my scale, but I just love it. I, I love bubbles. Yeah. It, it is. It's, it's, it's science I, up too, you know, yeah. ratchet it up a level. Yeah. Make it, it as complicated as you can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, uh, you know, so normally I, you know, I have rumors, you know, of trying to get everybody to get into the, into the world of bubbles, but I can't start a bubble sparkling rumor for you. So I think I might have to create like a, a, a Pinot based port rumor for you or something of that nature. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> Talk about another level of time and effort there. But that would be fun. That's, I think that's Ari's passion for sure. No. Yeah. Just, you know, well, yeah, no, I, I kind of heard you, you, yeah, I, I kind of heard you talking about it a little bit. I mean, I've, educate me, give me more information about this Pinot based uh, port. Well, luckily I have the experience sitting in Montreal where they make a 10 year Solera. Um, so, you know, big dreams. Like, wow, can I do a wine that takes 10 years to make? Uh, and we certainly can, and you know, we're exploring those things. And again, when you're so small, like to add a barrel onto such a, pro a program that's, you know, maybe this year breaks 100 cases, it's also pretty big. Uh, and small barrels are more expensive than uh, standard size barrels. So it's like trying to weigh those options. But one thing that's definitely happening this year with the increased exposure, I mean, I can't see and talking to you and Deeds Collective and getting picked up by a small distributor. It's definitely been a year of, in particular, the last couple of months. What really is that? What is the what does the future look like? What do we've talked about different wines over the years, be it whites or the reds or other sparklings and things like that. So we're definitely in this time. I think after I can see to make some really obviously exciting. I can see is that it's August and harvest time is right around the corner. So yeah, there's some fun stuff in the works, some experiments right. and. Got some investment in the uh, winery last year that helps us make, helps us expand. So, yeah. Well, very cool. It's, you know, so in, in talking about that, like if you were to win like the $400 million lottery, <laughs> what would you, what would you change? Which side do we have? This is like, <laughs> this is like he buys lottery tickets every week. And as we get closer to the lottery date, he's like, so if we win, <laughs> This is what's going to happen. Just fine. It's a fun day, you know, whatever, a buck here and there, maybe, you know, a couple bucks a month just for the, the play the what if game. Yeah, I don't know. That's always an interesting exactly. question. We love to travel uh, and we love around the world. And, you know, certainly love the wine, but do you go big and go huge? Do you, like, it's so interesting. I love some, like, sequitur, you know, and interim. Here are these powerhouse winemakers that are certainly of retirement age. They have the money to do whatever they want, but here they are opening a small. I mean, seemingly. Seemingly. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't remember what the production numbers have been around <laughs> or separate are, but they're, they're pretty small scale. Of so right. I mean, that's always something 
wine, that draw, that just like it's in your blood. You can't you just can't give it up. I love that Joe Dobbs, he said, I asked him why he didn't just retire and enjoy the rest of his days, do whatever he wanted. He said, I hadn't made my best wine yet. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. Yep. So who knows? Maybe we stay the same size. It is, and you know, do you know, better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we think about it. We, we think about it occasionally, like, oh, okay, if we could be bigger, if we could have a tasting room, if we could, what, what would that life look like? But, uh, you know, when I was a reporter, I wrote, I think I was evaluated, I had to do 10,000 words a week. And, um, you know, you get to the end of the week, and guess what you don't want to do? You don't want to write. And so when I got into the wine industry, I said, whatever I do, I want this to be sustainable uh, for my life. Meaning, you know, I want this to bring me joy and I want to feel joy when I do this. And however that plays out in this industry and whatever that looks like is what matters most. And because I've come to it maybe a little later than others in life and because I have bills that I have to pay that I can't necessarily just take a step back and chase the harvest. Um, my journey is not going to look like anybody else's and that's completely okay. And that's been something I've really embraced on this path because there's nothing that comparing myself to anybody else is going to do for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only trying to compare myself with myself and do the best I can do in a given year with what I have. And, you just enjoy it and see where it goes. I mean, that's, that's really what it's about for me. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I kind of do the same thing, you know, with the newsletter and the podcast and like, mm -hmm. yes, I enjoy it. It's fun, you know? And yeah. yes, are there weeks where I'm like, eh, I don't want to do the newsletter. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm job. just going to tell everybody I'm not going to do the newsletter this week. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Yep. So your estate vineyard, it is uh, named Black Feather after Johnson Black Feather, who um, represented the Shawnee Nation in 1903 in a case presented to the Supreme Court, fighting for land, uh, land rights, and was a Union soldier in the Civil War. Yes. That is quite something. How did you find out that he was your ancestor? So it's really interesting because, I, you know, we were always, you know, growing up, I knew we were always Cherokee Nation. Um, it's not something that was talked about much uh, outside of the household. And, you know, the older you get, the more you realize, oh, that's because my grandfather grew up during the Tulsa race riots as a Native American man. And he couldn't even, I mean, he was born in 1899. So old Native man. And he couldn't even vote until 1946. And so, you know, I've gone back and done some work and seen how in his own uh, journals, like he registers as white up until a certain year so he can vote. And then in the census changes his uh, uh, identity over, which is just, it's crazy. And so, you know, we knew this and I, and I had stories about my family, but, you know, dad talked about his grandmother, Eliza Blackfeather and I wanted to be able to speak more authentically to the name when I was talking about it with people. And I found that case and took it to my father. And I'm like, dad, what, what is this? And he's like, oh yeah, that was, you know, that was my grandfather. And um, yeah, he was principal chief of the Shawnee nation. <laughs> um, excuse me. <laughs> I never, never heard this. And then I've gone in and I, I've done some research, um, the whole ancestry trail and found that, well, his father was also a principal chief. And so was his father. And so was his father in tribal records going all the way back to the 1600s and had been able to find my band and my clan and the native names, not just the, the white names that they've been given. And that is incredibly significant and powerful to find later in your life. Um, it, it's been a really interesting journey. And I, uh, on a personal level, um, you know, as a native person, and I'm a white presenting native person, and I know that, and I know I have that privilege, but I see is this industry, and I love where Oregon's, I feel really focused on being more inclusive in the BIPOC movement, but I don't really see a voice for indigenous people 
uh, you know, Native American indigenous people in the industry. And it, we just have this approach that look at all these beautiful lands we're on. Well, those lands were managed by people for generations and generations and generations. And that's why they're here for us to enjoy them. And uh, there's nowhere where that's really being discussed. And that's something that I find really, really important, especially as we're looking at sustainability and the climate and what are we doing and how should we be connecting to the land and connecting to the land is no difference than a sense of place or it's no different than terroir. Um, I'm sorry. I feel very passionate about this. <laughs> um, it's just, it's no, a, keep it's on. A very, no, you're great. <laughs> it's, it's a very important uh, place for me, you know, like the average American I've read uh, can only identify 12 plants and that includes Christmas trees. And that's horrifying. <laughs> And if you can't even identify plants, how do you know what they're meant to do and how they connect us together and what significance they have? So definitely one of my passions has been, and, and Fair Singh has been great about uh, me doing this, is like, hey, can we talk more about Camus? Can we, can we talk more about the Three Sisters? Can we talk more about the Oak Savannas? Can we bring this aspect of story storytelling into what we do because we are the storytellers right now and it's our job to educate people and i think personally that that is what people are looking for like we're in the business of making a product but it's not really the product that people are seeking it is that connection it's that connection to the land that our modern life doesn't really give us it's that sense of place it's that kind of transcendent experience that you get when you have a really beautiful glass of wine that you kind of like take and it's special and it's on another level. And um, I guess that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about. <laughs> and I, I can totally agree with you. I mean, when, when you get to that human connection and yes. that human connection comes, you know, to the land as well, I mean, it just, it just resonates so deeply and I am so glad to see that you're passionate about it because, you know, that's, that's what all this is about. I mean, it's just getting back to a simpler time and a simpler kind of thought process and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Well, a more connected thought process, you know, it's more about, Hey, how, how do we sit to get down together and see each other and be present in a moment with each other right now versus thinking about what we're going to say next or looking at our cell phones or who has the next funny quip. It's let me hear what you have to say and let me sit with that and let me respect it and, and let me reciprocate, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And mm -hmm. on that kind of on that level, I mean, you've been, thoroughly involved in the Oregon wine community for years. And, you know, always asking this question is a little bit difficult because there's so many stories, but is there a story or two that just stands out to you of, holy cow, that is just the Oregon wine community showing up and presenting itself in, in all of its glory? That's a really good question. The first thing that comes to mind is just there both kind of general is a is salute. Uh, I've always been a huge supporter. We were on the board for a very, very short time or the procurement committee. Uh, I always felt really passionate that, you know, if we want to talk about the great wine is grown, not made, and here are these incredibly hardworking stewards out in the vineyards. And it's gotten, the recognition has gotten better every year. Uh, but that was always something I noticed in the very beginning that, you know, here we're celebrating the people that are making wine, but we weren't really celebrating the stewards. So that's something that to me is really indicative of that here. And just on top of also the, really the community as a whole, the way, because we did work in a tasting room in Southwest Washington that was very, like that region seemed at the time, I don't know now, to be very very kind of cutthroat and uh, it was all about each individual place and you know that can keep in mind individual perspectives. But then to come into Oregon and feel that collective nature. And we saw that so incredibly uh, really come to light during COVID. You know, here all the TC rooms, 
you know, they weren't able to get it. See what the CDC is saying. So, the tasty rooms, particularly on the Facebook, uh, thank you, Justina. Shout out to Justina and uh, her amazing work. You know, everyone is out there. How are you doing this? What's happening here? What reservation system? How is this working for you? Where are you getting this? And instead of everyone just siloing, which we were doing just in a natural state because all the events went away, we were still holding super tight as a community, you know, with each other. It's been really amazing. I would say on a production level, like especially being so small, you'd think that some people would just be like, oh, okay, that's cute. You know, you have your own little project and that's that's nice for you. But everybody is so kind and supportive of anything that I do. Like uh, Emily Terrell, who's the associate with Britain, couldn't be more supportive of me when I have questions about cold stabilization on uh, my bubbles or, you know, Chris Berg or Stephen Goff, you know, these really lovely um well-known people in the community who are very busy by their own right will always take the time to talk with me and not treat me like it's a lesser than kind of project you know like they the spirit is really there and that is incredibly special and I, I love the sense of community out here and it sounds like a like a platitude right but it's not I mean a sense of community it's what makes us feel like we're obligated to each other to make our lives better. And that is very real and very true about the Oregon wine industry. It is. And, you know, and even, you know, earlier you're talking about the, the cuttings, you know, for the vineyard and, <laughs> you know, like that was the Oregon wine community showing up right there and helping out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cooperation just All right. So I have some rapid, Oh. Yep, yep. Sorry about that. Yeah, there seems to be a little lag. My apologies. Um, but yeah, I'll get some rapid fire questions and then I'll I'll let you let you get out of here. Uh so if both of you want to answer or however you want to go is it's it's you know, however you want to do it. So favorite artist favorite artist to listen to during harvest. Oh, no, I'm gonna say uh, Black Keys. Black Keys. Black Keys. I'm going to say Don Giovanni by Mozart. It's just my favorite opera. It's, it's true. We do listen to opera. Yeah. But Black Keys for the hard production work. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, your favorite indulgent food? Nachos. <laughs> fair. <laughs> <That's> fair. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Oh, just listen to that whole, I, I don't know if it was Radio Lab or not, that they were doing the invisibility versus flying thing, and I got it land on flying. Mm, time travel. Time travel, 100%. <clears throat> Very nice. So what? Uh, if who is your favorite superhero? Wonder Woman. <laughs> I, never really, <laughs> I guess the only one i ever got into is batman so batman okay uh harvest notes are they digital or handwritten <laughs> hand handwritten for me uh, and yeah. digital very 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 poor handwriting <laughs> that yeah this uh, person being a reporter was not kind to my handwriting. <laughs> but I love there you it. Go. There you go. So uh, very nice. Uh, last book you read. It could be on Audible or it could even be like a uh, a podcast. I just finished. Uh, Don't you a whitehead? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just, oh, sorry, I can't just walk right there. Um, I just finished Mink River by Brian Doyle, um, which was brilliant, and I highly recommend everybody read it. Okay, I'll have to check that one out. It, it's set well, in like a. That is all the questions. I, that sounds, that sounds very interesting. Um, I don't have any other questions. I can let you all go. Do you have anything that you would like to say or 
Anything of that nature before we go? I just really appreciate you taking the time with us. I don't know how you found us. We're so small. We're always just so excited to meet people and talk about what we do and uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thank you. And you can, uh, you know, thank Ari for, you know, for letting me find you. <laughs> that guy. He was. Got to put yourself out there, you know. Yeah, he, he's all over the place. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thanks. Thanks. Also, thank you so much. I did really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in a uh, couple weeks out at IPNC. Yeah.